This is the Teachable Soul Podcast. Because we cannot possibly live long enough to make all the mistakes ourselves, let's take a few moments to learn from the mistakes of others. The Teachable Soul Podcast, where guests and listeners like you share stories of failure and teachable moments on the journey to success. Here's your host, Kat Daniels. Welcome to the Teachable Soul Podcast. Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing a fellow Teachable Soul and assistant women's basketball coach at the University of North Carolina, Greensboro. He is also the creator and host of the One Last Thought Podcast. He is a husband, father, leader, and instigator. Let's give a warm welcome to Ito Singer. Welcome, Ito. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, So I kind of wanted to start off talking about your podcast, if you don't mind. Um, The One Last Thought podcast, it is quick. Um, They're bite-sized little tidbits that everybody can use for life. I love it. And it kind of actually reminds me a little bit of like the gold cast videos. Mm. Have you seen those? Okay. Uh, I think so. I, I believe I've seen it, but I'm, I'm not as familiar as you are, I'm sure. Well, no, well, there's just a lot of like music and drama behind the things that they're saying. And they're very like, I compare it to that because of the music and everything behind it. And the, mm-hmm. the sentences that they have strung together, the gold cast videos usually like create a lot of unnecessary drama, honestly. <laughs> Where there doesn't need to be, but your podcast actually creates just emotion or evokes emotion behind the things that are being said, which I super appreciate about music anyway, in general. Thank you. I appreciate that. Oh, absolutely. So do you want to talk about like where you got the idea for this podcast a little bit? Because it's, it's a little bit different than most other podcasts out there. Yeah, I, I definitely, I'm, I'm happy talking about that podcast. It's my little baby. It's my little project. And I feel so uh, humble to be able to uh, create this platform where I'm outsourcing other people's advice and putting it together uh, for other people to enjoy and learn from. Mm. And so the idea for that podcast came from this thing that I did uh, over a year ago. I just sat in my house and I started getting You know how you scroll social media and you sometimes, depending on what you follow, but I follow a lot of people that I find motivating myself, like Gary Vaynerchuk or Inky Johnson and and people that just get me worked up and and excited and motivated when I feel down. Absolutely. And so scrolling through that, I started feeling, hey, this, this is, this is great. I love this kind of content. And all of a sudden I saw something and I, I retweeted it or I reposted it on Instagram and just wrote my two cents on it as a comment. And I just said playfully, and this is my one last thought for the day. Mm. And that was the last thing I posted that day. And then the next day I said, Hey, I like this thing. So I'm going to retweet it or repost it and added my two cents to it. And that was my last thought of the day. It just provoked me to think and and feel something. And so I just kept doing that for about a month. And I've gotten a lot of engagement and a lot of responses from different people who appreciated that, just the Mm -hmm. sharing and the two cents and just engage with it. And I realized I've always wanted to have a podcast, but I didn't know if I would be good enough at the Q&A format and just talking to people. But here's something that I just found that people are responding to. So how can I how can I make that into a podcast? And so I started reaching out to people and asking them for their best advice. Mm -hmm. What is your one piece of advice that you would uh, share with future generations? And people started sending me um, voice recordings of their one best piece of advice. And uh, looking at that giant, uh, I guess, archive of, of thoughts, I realized, hey, what if I weave those together? What if I take two thoughts that roughly speak about the same thing and I weave them together into a conversation that never took place. And I started experimenting with that. And that turned into a a podcast that's no longer than 10 minutes. And it has an intro and an outro like any other podcast. But if you kind of fast forward, you get about a five to six minutes of meat and potatoes, best advice you can find on the subject that we're covering for that week. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just feel like it's so it's the best of both worlds of the two people. It's their best advice. And I kind of weave it together and it becomes its own message. And um, the feedback's been quite amazing. And I've been doing it for a year every week and I just love creating it. And I always say I get the best advice to my, in, to my inbox every morning. So I just, I love being in this position of just curating these great nuggets of wisdom and then sharing them with the world. So 
Yeah, it's definitely, it's so perfect. You know, 10 minutes is is just enough time to get something in between, like to listen to it in between doing something else. Yeah. I love podcasts myself, obviously. <laughs> obviously. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, it's great. So why did you, you said that you always wanted to have a podcast. How, what, what brought that passion on for you? Well, you know, from my intro, I'm a little bit of an instigator. So I love talking to people and I love talking to people that don't necessarily share my views and my opinions on things. I don't like being in an echo chamber. I feel like growth happens when you are faced with having to listen and try to understand someone who doesn't share your opinions. And so I've been told that I'm a little bit of an instigator sometimes where I, you know, share opinions that might rub people the wrong way. And so I always wanted to have a podcast, but I never really knew how to put it together or what it is that I wanted to talk about. And when I came up with this idea, I realized that I don't have all the answers. I don't have all the wisdom, obviously, but I can reach out to a thousand people that may have uh, other points of view that are worthy of sharing. And to date, I have about 900 people involved with this project. Wow. So it is growing every day. And I just, I love it. I keep reaching out to people and I get some very inspirational, very eye-opening things that I never thought about. Mm. And so, and so that is, I feel like this has been such a, a great project for me. And I have a full-time job that I love and mm -hmm. a family that I love and my, the rest of my spare time, however little that is, goes into that podcast. And I just love making it. Oh, I bet. Yeah. That's, I feel honestly a little bit like our podcast, like people who do podcasts, um, most of the creators that I speak with, the podcast is, you know, really starts out more for them <laughs> than oh, it yeah. even does. But they're just like, well, if I need it, then somebody else probably needs it, you know? And they're like, so I'm just going to share it too. Because that's certainly <laughs> how I started. <laughs> I, I agree. I think if you go into this business, if you're not Joe Rogan or somebody like that, if you go into right. this business thinking you're going to monetize and quit your job after a month, you're probably going to quit after a month because you're not going to. Mm -hmm. It has to be a labor of love. There has to be a purpose behind it. And you have to genuinely enjoy doing it if you're not making a cent. Because right. if you don't, you're probably not long for this profession. Yeah. Exactly. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of your full-time job and, and professions, you are the assistant women's basketball coach at the University of North Carolina, right? North Carolina, Greensboro. Yes. Greensboro. Okay. And how did you get into that? How were you, did you grow up in North Carolina? Did you always want to be a basketball coach? How, how did that come about? No, I actually, I was born and raised in Israel. And, oh. uh, I, yeah, and I was, uh, I grew up there until I was about 22 years old. I played professionally over there from the age of 17 to 22. And then one day I decided that I no longer want to play. And so I moved to the States. I went to school on the West coast in San Diego for a couple of years. I moved to New York, continued school over there and realized that there's something, something is missing. I've always been around basketball since I was seven years old and the, I, I couldn't play anymore, obviously, but being away from the game for so long, I've decided I wanted to go into coaching. And so I started coaching at the younger levels in New York, um, kind of building my portfolio, my experience. And when I met my wife, um, a few years later in New York, we moved to Massachusetts. I started coaching in college in division three and moved my way up and, um, I now and I am now an assistant coach at UNCG, and it's a, a Division One job, which is you know the highest level of uh, of college basketball that we have. And so, you know, it's been a, a crazy, very um, up and down kind of path. It took me ten years to get to where I am right now, and so many of my life lessons that I you know I would love to share come from that kind of path. Mm -hmm. uh, it was definitely not easy, but I, I'm so happy uh, to be where I am right now. Right. I bet. Yeah. And it's the not easy parts that we like to get into. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So let's go back to, you said that you, you just decided one day when you were 22 that you didn't want to play basketball anymore. Yeah. <laughs> For no reason. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, I, I felt like I was devalued uh, as a player. Mm -hmm. um, I, at that point I was a professional player. I was making a lot less money than I thought I was uh, supposed to make, or at least I saw players at my level making a lot more money than me. And, 
Mm. Most of it had to do with the fact that I was very um, short for my position. I'm, I'm mm-hmm. a six foot five forward. Uh, <laughs> we're in, in a league of six, eight, six, nine, six, ten. Yeah. And so for me, I felt like I was devalued. I wasn't paid what I was supposed to get paid. And I've decided that it was, uh, yeah, I fell out of love with it. Mm. And uh, I think in hindsight, it was a little bit of a mistake. I was a little rash yeah. um, to leave, but, but I don't regret where I am right now. So if it led me here, I'm happy with it. Right. Of course. Yeah. I think at 22, we've all, you know, made certain rash decisions that we probably shouldn't <laughs> <Absolutely>. have. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's another podcast, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So how did you get from, or how did you decide, did you decide to move to the States from Israel or like, did your family move with you? How did that occur? I just, I decided to move by myself. My, uh, my older uh, brother, my half brother uh, did the same thing right after his military service in Israel. He was 21 years old. He moved to New York and he's lived there ever since. Hmm. And so it's okay. always been this romanticized notion of living in America for me and being in New York, which I had the pleasure of being in for eight years. I've lived in New York. So mm-hmm. uh, it was always that. It was always in the back of my mind. I've always loved the American culture. I, I remember teaching myself English when I was six years old in Israel. Mm-hmm. I've always been self-taught with language like that. So That's it's crazy. always been something that I wanted to do. Yeah. And so when I had the opportunity to do it at, at the age of 22, I had no more strings attached. I don't have mm-hmm. a family. I mean, I have a family, but I didn't have a wife or kids or a job that I was attached to. Mm-hmm. I just said, you know what? I'm going for it. Mm-hmm. And, and I don't regret it. I've, I've been here since uh, 2003 in the States, so 17 years. And I have my own family now and a career. And I'm just so fortunate to to have been in the position to, to build what I've built here. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Having the the freedom <laughs> at age 22 to do those things is one of the benefits of being young. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. you know, it's, it's a decision. You either go out there and you take a chance when you're young because that's the time to do it. Mm-hmm. Or you sit back when you're 40 and you go, I should have taken a chance. Right. Um, exactly. Just, yeah. Yeah. I think now though, that we're, as we're, evolving, you know, and we're, we're growing older a lot longer or being old, I guess, a lot longer than some of our ancestors were. I think that we can start over sometimes even from 40. I mean, obviously not always, but. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. It's a mindset. It's a (laughs) Mm -hmm. mindset and it's a decision and and pivoting is something we do in basketball all the time. It's a part of, it's a part of the game. And, And I think people have the opportunity right now to pivot. Uh, Mm -hmm. These are great times to pivot, reinvent yourself and refocus on what's really important. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The the whole world has to pivot anyway. So you might as well go pivot into something that you would like to do for the rest of your life. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) So um, you, so did you move? Was that where that, I have so many questions. So I have never been to, (laughs) thank you. (laughs) So I have never been to Israel. Um, Was, was there culture shock for you whenever you got to the States or, or because your brother was already here, did you like know what to expect? You know, we kind of pride ourselves in being a very uh, advanced, very maybe European style, Middle Eastern country. Mm -hmm. Um, we are very, very heavily influenced by American culture. So there wasn't much of a culture shock. Mm -hmm. It was more of a, um, I guess I had to adjust to being away from family, being away from friends, having to immediately go to school, which I haven't done in, in about three years. I was three years out of high school and in the army. And so this was a bit of a transition for me, but it was never really a culture shock. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, I was, I was the foreigner. I was saying some funny things because you still, sometimes you translate phonetically from Hebrew and it comes out a little funny, but I I think it was endearing. I don't think it was anything uh, more than that. So I, I didn't experience that. I think I've prepared myself very well through, you know, just being exposed to American culture, watching a lot of American TV in Israel Hmm. and uh, yeah, visiting my brother in New York. I did that before I moved to the States and, and yeah, I I was, I was lucky. I was able to uh, simulate pretty well. Awesome. Yeah, that's Mm -hmm. great. I, um, my husband visited there once and he went to like the church and everything out there. Um, but he showed me a map of how the, the city is, um, or the major city there is, uh, 
What's the word? Thinking of Tel Aviv or Jerusalem or Jerusalem. Haifa? Yeah. Jerusalem. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. No. Were you? <laughs> where are you from in Israel? So I am from um, center uh, of Israel, around Tel Aviv, in that area, right by the beach, kind of. Oh, okay. So Jerusalem would be about forty minutes south east. Oh, okay. So it would be even different, even more different yeah. for you then. Okay. Oh, absolutely. Hmm. Yeah. That's interesting. <laughs> okay. So you got here and you went to school. What did you, why did you go to school? Did you go to, I mean, I assume you went to college. Yes. Yeah. Um, see, here we go. We're, we're back to pivoting. I <laughs> yeah. wanted, to go, wanted to go to school to, I started a marketing major. Uh, as a marketing major in in San Diego, I was uh, I went to school at Grossmont College, a community college, and um, you know I just wanted to do something where I could afford to pay for it because as an interna- as an international student, mm-hmm. you're not really able to um, you know I didn't have the bankroll to just go to San Diego State and pay full tuition, and it was right. something that I had an opportunity to do. So I just decided to enroll in a community college and see what I like to do. And I started studying marketing and I enjoyed it. But two years in, I've realized it wasn't for me. Mm. So I pivoted and I started, uh, I wanted to finish my degree with a psychology um, major as a psychology major. So I finished, um, you know, I got a, uh, a bachelor's in psychology. So that was my first pivot. And then I pivoted again and realized that I wasn't going to be a psychologist. So <laughs> I started uh, coaching. Mm-hmm. And so and yeah, and, and it was always uh, it was always something I wanted to do was to come out here and, and go to school and and experience that culture. So I, I got a chance to do it, but you have to be um, reevaluating where you want to go in life constantly, mm-hmm. and you have to be able to pivot and make some tough decisions. And and I did. Right. Okay. So I understand marketing, like that makes sense. I get it. But what made you want to go into psychology from marketing? Um, so the second I decided that I'd no longer wanted to do marketing, mm-hmm. uh, my next move had nothing to do with what I just did to me. If I've decided to move away from something, I can't let my next decision be affected, but what I just did. Mm-hmm. So I'm glad you asked the question the way you did, because when I decided to go to psychology, I no longer was thinking marketing and I wasn't trying to get away from marketing or do something similar to marketing. Marketing was done. Mm -hmm. So what is it that I'm passionate about? Well, I like people. I like understanding what makes people tick, how people operate, how they think. And so I found that interesting. Mm -hmm. And so I I pursued that before I knew I was going to be a basketball coach. But I find that so beneficial for basketball coaches, being able to understand psychology, uh, pressure situations, yeah, uh, how to talk to people, how to how to be a good listener, because this, that's something that's really big in, in my profession and in most professions anyway. Yeah. So and that was the reason. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. I think psychology is helpful in pretty much anything, but um, and, and important yeah. as well. But um, yeah, Absolutely. being like an actual psychologist is definitely not for anybody. <laughs> <laughs> no, not for me. <laughs> yeah, me neither. I thought I wanted to be at one point in time, but then I was like, mm, better not. <laughs> That's a lot of work. Yeah, Actually. it's a lot of mental sure. work. It's uh, a yeah. lot of weight to carry, <laughs> I felt like. Absolutely. Yeah. So how did you get into basketball coaching here? I mean, I know that you were a professional. Did you did you just walk up to a school and you were like, hey, I used to be a professional basketball player. I can coach. <laughs> See, I wish it was that easy. Right? (laughs) I wish. Um, You know, sometimes you're able to do that. Um, Sometimes you're able to, I mean, if I was an NBA player walking onto a college campus and uh, say I was, uh, you know, somebody semi-famous from the NBA and saying, hey, I really want to get back into, get into coaching. I think I would have a good chance of getting an interview. But Mm -hmm. for me, uh, playing in Israel, it wasn't, it wasn't the case at all. I had to start coaching. And this is a big point of pride for me. I'm here today um, Mm -hmm. because I put in all the work 10 years ago. I was coaching in people's backyards. I Mm. was putting together uh, workouts for five and six year olds in the park. And I would travel an hour to do that. Mm. Um, And so I did all the grassroots stuff. 
And I, I used to, I used to just get myself out there for, you know, for many reasons. A, I needed to support myself. B, I needed to get better at my craft. I needed to test different things and I needed to build a portfolio and, and be really prepared for when the opportunity presented itself. So I definitely worked my way up. I was never handed anything. And I, um, before I got hired at UNCG, I was, um, my resume was, was good enough to get hired in college basketball, but, uh, I got 107 no answers, um, throughout that, uh, hiring period before I got the one yes from UNCG. You counted? And I, I not only counted, I have a, an Excel spreadsheet <laughs> with oh, everything. Wow. I know exactly who said, who said no to me. And I did that because I know one day I'm going to write about it or do something about it, but I wanted something that I can literally pay attention to and say, this is the amount of times I had to hear no before I heard that one yes. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's going to serve as a lesson to younger coaches and, and people who are going for jobs that um, you're going to hear a lot of no. Right. Do you stop after no number 30, right. 50, 100? I, I didn't. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so you never know when that yes is coming. It's around the corner somewhere but you just can't stop. And so I needed to put a number to that. Yeah, absolutely. And I love the way that you worded it too, when you said that you had to like perfect your craft. And so you went out and just did it and you found a way to do it because in, in a profession like yours, I wouldn't have even have imagined or thought that you could go out and do something yourself that would lead you down that path eventually. Mm -hmm. Like I thought that you would have to, you know, start, coaching a league or something like that, you know, and, and know somebody basically to get in, but you, you really did. I mean, you still created your own path to get you to the league and and where you are now even. Yeah. You you definitely have to know people. Um, Most jobs that are posted in my profession are already promised to someone before they're posted. Mm -hmm. And so openings aren't real openings uh, most of the time. And so you have to have people, um, go to bat for you and and speak highly of you. But that's, that's the art of networking. That's uh, proven, proving that you are a hard worker, that you're willing to do whatever it takes, that you're open to learning, that you have experience and that you've worked your way up. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was, like I said, I was never given anything in life. I always had to go for it and and work really hard for it. And I pride myself on that. Um, I literally climbed every, every rung on the ladder uh, that led me to where I am right now. And I'm still climbing. Right. Yeah. That's amazing. That's awesome. (laughs) So you said that you went from New York to Michigan and now you're in North Carolina, right? Uh, Yeah. New York, Massachusetts, North Carolina. Yes. One of those end states. Yeah. I get them all confused. Sorry. (laughs) Maine. Yeah. Right. (laughs) (laughs) So, um, Did you, did you start, coaching basketball in New York or did you start in Massachusetts? So I coached a little bit in Israel. I've had some experience coaching at the very young ages, uh, very young age levels of five and six years old. Mm-hmm. But I started in New York. Um, like I said, I started with, with very young players uh, working one-on-one or in small groups. And then I coached uh, middle school girls for three years while coaching uh, junior varsity girls for three years as well. Um, so yeah, I started, uh, I started at the very young ages and, uh, and just kind of worked myself all the way up. I still worked with players who are under 18 up until I'd say about five years ago. So I'm not oh, that wow. far removed. Right. Yeah. yeah. Were you working a full-time job while doing that and just doing that as a side thing or was that your full-time job? I wish, you know, in New York, I always had a full-time job. I was bartending. So I wow. would, uh, I would be, uh, working from probably 3 PM to 4 AM mm-hmm. and, uh, going to sleep for a few hours and then waking up in the morning and having to, uh, carry a 50 pound bag full of bowls and equipment on the subway to go all the way uptown and work out a bunch of kids and then continue making my way down to practice and getting back home to eat something and going right back out to bartending. I would, literally have no time for anything and just work, 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 work. Yeah. That's crazy. (laughs) So how did you get to go to Massachusetts then? I met my wife. I met Ah. my wife at the bar that I was working at. And it's such a, I I, I think it's a great story. And 
I think it's Yay, a tell lesson. it. Please, yeah, sure. <laughs> I'll tell it. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> so um so I was working at this bar in Midtown. Mm-hmm. And uh Midtown, New York. It was around forty sixth street uh, on the west side. So it was very busy bar and um it was very lucrative job. Shifts there were very, very lucrative and and so they were hard to come by. But I was so tired from working the entire week and I had a Sunday shift mm-hmm. and I just couldn't get myself to work. Like I couldn't do it. And on Saturday I'm trying to call everybody. Will you take my shift, please? Will you take my shift? A Sunday shift, you'll make three hundred and fifty bucks guaranteed. Mm-hmm. Like it's good money. Please take my shift. <laughs> no one would take my shift. <laughs> and so tried calling in sick. They didn't buy it. I had to go to work. And mm-hmm. so I kind of dragged my feet there and I went to work. Mm-hmm. Now pivoting to my wife, she had her friend that she worked with. She was also a bartender and server at the time in New York. And she had a, her best friend had just moved to California. That was somebody she'd worked with. But once a year, she comes back to New York and they do this whole day you know, girls day out where they just go and eat good food and drink good wine and just enjoy the city. Mm -hmm. And so they ended up at a restaurant across the street from my bar. Mm -hmm. And so when they got done with eating, they just looked across the street and they decided to walk into the bar. They just wanted one more drink. Uh, Now, mind you, I'm, I'm at the bar. I'm miserable my side of the bar, I was working the back end of the bar. And so my side was empty because it was pretty slow. And the front of the bar usually gets full first. It was two Mm -hmm. bartenders on shift. Mm -hmm. She walks in, obviously many seats at the back of the bar. She sits down with her friend. And I swear at that moment, I just, I don't remember what happened afterwards. I just know for the next two and a half hours, it was just me talking to her. I have neglected my work. <laughs> I was just enjoying getting to know her and her friend. Mm-hmm. And um, the reason I'm telling that story was because she had just heard, she's also Jewish like myself. She just heard that day that she was accepted to this program that sends people to Israel, Jewish people to Israel that have never been there on a free trip. Oh. Just, you know, yeah. So she just got accepted. You don't really get a lot of opportunities to do that and she was joking with her friend that day and she said i'm going to go to israel and i'm going to come back with an israeli husband <laughs> lo and behold she walks into my bar right? and she met her israeli <laughs> husband in new york <laughs> the day she figured out that she was going to israel oh that's funny <sighs> yeah and um you know i i immediately we exchanged information i said i'm going to call you Tomorrow, we're going out tomorrow. I have off. I don't care if I have a job. I don't, I don't care. We're mm-hmm. going out tomorrow. And we did. And we started dating. And fast forward a year later, we're you know, living together. And we get a dog. And then we moved to Massachusetts, where she's from. And uh, we spent the last uh, few years there, got married, kids. We have three kids. Uh, and now we live in North Carolina. And what I love about this story is... I've had so many opportunities to not be there that day. Right. I was really, really trying to not be at that place that was completely going to change my life Mm -hmm. in the best way possible. But the universe, God, I don't know, whatever people subscribe to is fine. Whatever you want to call it. Right. It has a plan for us Mm -hmm. and we can't always fight it and we shouldn't always fight it sometimes we just have to go with the cards that we're dealt with and just try and make the best out of them and right. the card i was dealt with that day was i wasn't allowed to slack off i had to go to work mm-hmm. and so by just submitting to that and going in i was in the right place at the right time to meet my wife right so don't don't go against don't go against it too much. Just be open to whatever it is that life has to offer because you never know what's what's coming to see you from across the street just finishing their dinner. Right? Aw, that's the <laughs> sweetest story. <laughs> I'm going to that's meet my awesome. Israeli husband in Israel. Yeah, you have right. no idea. <laughs> <laughs> that's too funny. Yeah. How long after you guys met did she get to go on the trip? She, uh, she had to go, uh, maybe two weeks after. So we did it for two weeks and she had to go. Mm -hmm. We basically talked every day at that Mm -hmm. time. And yeah, uh, (laughs) within a year we lived together. 
uh, less than that. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it was pretty quick. We got married pretty quickly, kids as quickly as we could. And mm -hmm. I mean, we're so we're so happy right now. We got twin Aww. five year old girls and a two year old boy. So. Oh, my gosh. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah that's so cool wow how yeah. how was twins that sounds scary to me honestly oh my goodness <laughs> it's a <laughs> it's a challenge but they're they're amazing kids I mean, we're mm. so lucky they teach us so much all the time oh right they're so much smarter than i am it's unreal oh i know <laughs> same yeah i've got two kids and they're just yeah they blow my mind all the time you know. i was just telling my sister the other day i was like you know uh, I used to complain because I thought that like parenting was just, or that, that rather my parents' generation was just about keeping your kids alive basically. And that was it. <laughs> and I, then like through like the pandemic and everything at this point, I'm like, I don't know anymore. I don't know how to raise you people. <laughs> I, you're, you're surviving. And I guess that's enough for now. I don't know what else to do. <laughs> You know, I, I I understand that. I, I think, and, and I'm sure you'll agree as parents, I think our job is to make sure that our kids are A, better than us, mm -hmm. and B, have an opportunity to be the best people that they can be, like the kindest, most amazing people that they can be. And we, yeah. uh, I know we always try and teach them to be kind, to not judge, to right. be empathetic to people. I mean, it's hard, you know, the, the first two or three years of their lives, you really try and teach them empathy because mm -hmm. if they don't feel empathy your life is really gonna be hard right? if they don't care how hard they're working you every day yes it's gonna be hard for you so empathy is so big but mm -hmm. i think we we lose that as we get older we oh, stop yeah. putting ourselves in other people's shoes and we we kind of relinquish empathy for judgment mm -hmm. and that's not a good substitute it really right. isn't so i think we just try and make sure that they don't judge and they just try and understand who the people are individually. Mm -hmm. That is That's such it. a good point. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> now how did you get from Massachusetts to North Carolina now? So remember we talked about networking and, and yeah. networking is something you, um, I, I feel it's like a, it's like a savings account. You know, one, or, or maybe a piggy bank, you don't want to break. You, mm -hmm. you keep putting little pennies in there and um, you nurture these relationships. And one day, without even knowing about it, something happens because you kept putting in more and more money into that. You kept making deposits into those relationships. Mm -hmm. The reason I had the opportunity to be an assistant at UNCG or I had the opportunity um, two years ago when I started here wasn't mm -hmm. because my resume was better than anyone else's. It was because somebody that I had met on Facebook 12 years prior to that and stayed in touch with is at the place that she's at today, knowing the person that ended up hiring me 12 years later. Wow. And so, yeah. And so the power of relationships and networking, having someone speak highly of you without you knowing is, is amazing. This right? coach, uh, coach Curry, she is the only female assistant coach in NCAA men's basketball right now. Mm, wow. And she's def yeah, she's, she's family. She's family to me. Uh, she's never met my family, but we've seen each other many times. Mm -hmm. And that was a relationship that we started cultivating with each other when I was coaching the peewees and she was over in China coaching peewees. Oh my gosh. And and yeah, and, and we've stayed together uh, in contact with each other for 12 years, exchanging ideas and keeping in touch and just rooting each other, uh, just just trying to um, empower one another. Hey, good job. Next job. Keep going. You, you got this. All these little positive deposits that we put into one another. She made a phone call for me. I didn't know that. I was getting my 107th no, and she was making a phone call to her friend, who is my boss right now, my head coach at UNCG, saying, hey, I know you're looking to hire someone. I have the right guy for you. You need to give him a call. And so I'm sitting in my car one day thinking about what am I going to do now? I was literally thinking at that point, because it was getting close to that point, because mm -hmm. I was um, unemployed for nine months. Mm -hmm. I was thinking I have to take another job. I, I think I'm going to have to move away from coaching. I'm going to have to give up what I love to do the most. Mm -hmm. And Coach Patterson calls me and says, hi, this is Coach Patterson from UNCG. Uh, how are you? I'm, 
And I go, who are you? <laughs> right. I, I had no idea that she was going to call. Mm -hmm. But that's because, you know, we invested in one another, in the relationship, in, in the, the, the friendship that we had. And, and that's networking. That's why mm -hmm. I'm at UNCG right now. That's why my family and I are so happy to be here. It was because of something that I started 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. It's just the way it is. Right. That, it mm -hmm. is. that is also an amazing story. You've had quite a, a good life there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so fortunate. I get to right? have, I have, get to have a great family. I love what I do. And then I love podcasting as well. So, you know, there's not a lot of people that say that they have two jobs that they love. Right. I, I'm just so fortunate. I appreciate that every day. Absolutely. That's awesome. Yeah. Some people are still out there trying to find the first thing that they want to do. You know? keep, and you keep get to doing do it. all the things. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Keep doing it. Keep finding it. Don't mm -hmm. settle. Keep going for it. It's out there. That is super awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing your, your journey with us and your teachable moments. Were there any other specific teachable moments that you've thought about that you might like to share? Before? <sighs> uh, just work hard. I feel like we're kind of, we're, we're getting to this, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't want to get political, but I feel that, you know, we've been handed out some things during this time. Mm -hmm. And I want to, I want people to remember there's no substitute for hard work. There's no mm -hmm. substitute for really just grinding and, and trying to make the best out of your life, make the best out of your situation and try and create the best situation for your family. If you have one mm -hmm. and, just get out there and work. Don't ever, ever, ever think that there's anything that can be a substitute for hard work. Um, we're, we're a culture of, of achievement and we need to keep trying to achieve. And I don't know a better way to do it other than put your head down, get, get it done mm -hmm. and, and just work hard. So if I have to leave any kind of notion, it's, it's hard work and I'm a living proof of that. Yeah, absolutely. I would definitely say that you worked hard to get where you are for sure. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, again, the podcast is one last thought. And do you want to like, where are you on social media? Do you want to leave out anything or like where people can find you if they want to find you? Sure. Um, you can go to one last thought pod pod dot com where you can find everything. Or if you want to find me on social media, it's one last thought pod on anything. The one is the number one. So number one, last thought pod anywhere. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you so much <laughs> again. And I hope that you have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. You too. And thanks everybody. You have been listening to the Teachable Soul podcast. You can find us on any social media platform, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram as The Teachable Soul or on Twitter as Teachable Soul. Also, if you'd like to help support the show, you can find us at patreon.com slash The Teachable Soul. You can also visit our website for more information at theteachablesoul.com. 